Hello friends, this is Jim here with Science Talk. In my continuing uh, series of videos discussing major oscillatory systems on planet Earth, this video we're going to look at the North Atlantic Oscillation. Okay, the NAO is a weather phenomenon in the North Atlantic Ocean of fluctuations in the difference of atmospheric pressure at sea level, called C -le SLP, sea level pressure, between the Icelandic low and the Azores, Azores high. Through fluctuations in the strength of the Icelandic low and the Azores high, it controls the strength and direction of westerly winds and location of storm tracks across the North Atlantic. It is also part of the Arctic Oscillation and varies over time with no particular periodicity, which makes analyses a little more challenging. Now, I've just completed a video. I was discussing gyros and rotating system. So hopefully now you have a, a good handle when we start discussing that because highs and lows are going to really play a, a, a strong part in when we look at the NAO, the Arctic Oscillation, and the uh, Atlantic Multidecadal uh, Oscillation. So what's going on here? The NAO was discovered through several studies in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Unlike the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean, the NAO is a largely atmospheric mode. Okay? Remember in our discussion with uh, ENSO, it was not only the atmosphere and the low pressure system, but also what was going on with the ocean and how the atmosphere was uh, impacting the ocean, like the fisheries example. Uh, and uh, just the flow of the, of the water, how the water is piling up, etc. So um, the NAO is more atmospheric, but it's still going to impact the ocean. But as we saw with, the, with ENSO, ENSO and uh, the ocean and the atmosphere are really tightly tied together. Right? Recall that when the, you know, the wind blowing from east to west are really strong, uh, pushes the water towards Indonesia and Australia. That allows the picnocline to uh, rise up on the eastern side with the upwelling and good for the fishery. When the winds reverse or weaken, then all that water that piled up on the western side moves to the east, get that warm water blob moving to the east, and then the picnocline is depressed. Instead of having an upwelling, you have a downwelling, and the fisheries don't do as well. Right. All, all the tied in with the, the wind forcing, which is tied into the atmos atmospheric system, the highs and the lows, and how they're moving back and forth. And then, of course, we tie that all together with uh, the IPO and more so the PDO. You know, I consider the IPO and PDO to be kind of a, an integrated system. Uh, but be that as it may, we saw all that. And uh, I, that was all discussed in, pr in prior videos. The North Atlantic Oscillation is closely related to the Arctic Oscillation, which is the AO. Something that's called the Northern Annular Mode. And then you have the Southern Annular Mode, which is basically um, Antarctica, but should not be confused with the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, or uh, AMO. Okay? It's funny because in Latin, uh, AMO means I love. That's interesting. But... Uh, so um, I will be doing a separate video of the Arctic Oscillation. I thought about doing both of these in one video, but it might be end up being very long-winded. They already are long-winded, my videos on this stuff. So this will be a separate video, but it will follow right after the NAO. And then that will in turn follow by the AMO. Westerly winds blowing across the Atlantic bring moist air into Europe. In years where the westerlies are strong, the summers are cool, winters are mild, rain is frequent. <coughs> Excuse me. If the westerlies are suppressed, the temperature is more extreme in summer and winter, leading to heat waves, deep freezes, and reduced rainfall or any uh, precipitation, if, uh, be that. A permanent low pressure system over Iceland, the Icelandic low, and a permanent high pressure system over the Azores, the Azores high, control the direction and strength of westerly winds into Europe. The relative strengths and positions of these systems vary from year to year 
and this variation is known as the NAO. A large difference in the pressure at the two stations, high index here, denoted as NAO plus, leads to increased westerlies and consequently cool summers, mild wet winters in Central Europe and its Atlantic facade. In contrast, if the index is low, NAO negative, westerlies are suppressed, northern European areas suffer cold, dry winters, and storms track southwards towards the Mediterranean Sea. This brings increased storm activity and rainfall to southern Europe and North Africa. Okay. Especially during the months from November to April, the NAO is responsible for much of the variability of weather in the North Atlantic region, affecting wind speed, wind direction changes, changes in temperature, moisture distribution, and the intensity, number, and track of storms. Research now suggests that the NAO may be more predictable than previously assumed, and skillful winter forecasts may be possible for the NAO. Like anything else, you collect more data, your understanding improves, that will enable us to predict better what happens in the future. There is some debate as to how much the NAO impacts, impacts short-term weather over North America. While most agree the impact of the NAO is much less over the U.S. than for Western Europe, the NAO is also believed to affect the weather over much of upper central eastern areas of North America, tied into the Arctic Oscillation. During the winter, when the uh, index is high, the Icelandic low draws a stronger southwesterly circulation over the eastern half of the North American continent, which prevents Arctic air from diving southward into the U.S. south of 40 degrees latitude. In combination with uh, El Nino, this effect can produce significantly warmer winters over the upper Midwest and New England. Now you notice, being mentioned El Nino here, mentioning Arctic uh, Oscillation. Right. That's what's implied here with the Arctic air uh, statement. All these systems are tied together, one big planetary system. The impact of the Southeast area is still uh, being discussed and debated. When the NAO index is low, negative, the upper central, northeastern portions of the U.S. can incur winter cold outbreaks more than the norm with associated heavy snowstorms. Because now what happens? The flow, instead of coming out of the, the southwest, coming out of the northeast. And what is New England known for? Nor'easters. <laughs> In summer, strong negative NAO is thought to contribute to a weakened jet stream that normally pulls zonal systems into the Atlantic Basin, contributing significantly to excessively long-lasting heat waves over Europe. Now, uh, a, a brief word here. Zonal systems are systems that flow in a basically east, west, west, east direction. In other words, they follow latitudinal lines. Then you hear meridional systems. Meridional systems are north, south, south, north, following latitudinal, excuse me, longitudinal lines. So zonal follow latitudinal lines, meridional follow longitudinal lines. Okay? So when you see that, that's that's what you need to remember. On the effects of the North Atlantic sea level, <clears throat> excuse me, under a positive uh, NAO index, regional reduction in atmospheric pressure results in a regional rise in sea level due to the inverse barometer effect. Okay. Reduce the, if you're putting pressure over water and you reduce the pressure over the water, the water's going to want expand. Okay. Putting high pressure on the water, pushes the water down. Relieve that pressure and the water's going to expand. It's going to rise up. This effect is important to both the interpretation of historic sea level records and predictions of future sea level trends, as mean pressure fluctuations on, of the order of millibars can lead to sea level fluctuations of the order of centimeters. And then you add in uh, you know, glacial melt from land ice and thermal expansion, and you have those uh, parameters to uh, take into account. What about hurricanes in the North Atlantic? Controlling the position of the Azores high, the NAO also influences the direction of general storm path for major North Atlantic tropical cyclones, low pressure system. A position of the Azores high farther to the south tends to force storms into the Gulf of Mexico, Katrina. 
whereas a northern position allows them to track up the North American Atlantic coast. So if you're in North Carolina, Virginia, watch out. A paleotempestological research has shown tempestological, tempest, storms, and paleo. So this is basically looking at uh, storms of the past. Few major hurricanes struck the Gulf Coast during 3,400 BC and again during the most recent millennia. These quiescent intervals were separated by hyperactive period during 1400 BC and 1000 AD when the Gulf Coast was struck frequently by catastrophic hurricane and the landfall probabilities increased by three to five times. So 3000 to 14, 1400 uh, BC, nah, not much slamming into the Gulf Coast. From 1400 BC to 1000 AD, it was getting the shit kicked out of it. <laughs> Basically is what they're saying. What about ecological effects? Until recently, the NNO had been in an overall more positive regime since the late 1970s, bringing colder conditions to the Northwest Atlantic, which has been linked with the thriving populations of Labrador sea snow crabs, which have a low temperature optimum. The NAO's positive warming of the North Sea reduces survival of cod larvae, they prefer cooler waters, which are at the upper limits of their temperature tolerance, as does the cooling in the Labrador Sea, where the cod larvae are at the lower temperature limits. Though not the critical factor, the NAO positive peak in the early 1990s may have contributed to the collapse of the Newfoundland cod fisheries. Along with overfishing, let's, uh, let's not forget to add that in. On the east coast of the U.S., a, a positive NAO causes warmer temperatures and increased rainfall, thus warmer, less saline surface water. Less saline surface water means the water is not as dense. It's not going to sink. This, this is important. This prevents nutrient-rich upwelling, which has reduced productivity. Because you're basically capping it off. The Georges Bank and the Gulf of Maine are affected by this reduced cod catch. Now, here's an interesting thing about, I just have to throw this in here. It doesn't show you how widespread the influences of these systems are. Jonas and Juren in 2007 found a strong signal between the NAO and grasshopper species composition in the tall grass prairies of the Midwestern U.S. They found that even though the NAO does not significantly affect the weather in the Midwest, there was a significant increase in abundance of common grasshopper species following winters during the positive phase of NAO and a significant increase in the abundance of less common species following winters during a negative phase of the NAO. This is thought to be the first study showing link between NAO and terrestrial insects in North America. And by the way, you can now, you know, what goes on in North America is also tied into what happens with ENSO, as I showed you in that ENSO video. Now, the winter of 2009-2010 in Europe was unusually cold. It is hypothesized that this may be due to a combination of low solar activity, a warm phase of the El Enso, and a strong easterly phase of the quasi-biennial uh, biennial oscillation all occurring simultaneously. The Met Office, that's a major research uh, uh, group in the UK, they're based in the UK, reported that the UK, for example, had experienced its coldest winter for 30 years. This coincided with an exceptionally negative phase of the NAO. Analysis published in mid-2010 confirmed that the concurrent El Nino event and the rare occurrence of an extremely negative NAO were involved, and this has been known as, is now known as a hybrid El Nino. So a negative NAO with El Nino creates some pretty snotty condition for Europe and the UK. During the winter of 2010-2011 in northern Western Europe, the Icelandic low, typically positioned west of Iceland, east of Greenland, appeared regularly to the east of Iceland. So it moved over significantly and so allowed exceptionally cold air into Europe from the Arctic. A strong area of high pressure was initially situated over Greenland, reversing the normal wind pattern in the northwestern Atlantic, creating a blocking pattern 
driving warm air into northeastern Canada and cold air into Western Europe, as was the case during the previous winter. This occurred during a La Nina season and is connected to the rare Arctic Dipole Anomaly. I will have a video on the Arctic Dipole. And a spoiler alert, a, uh, some, some people that I used to work with at, uh, at IARC, the International Arctic Research Center, were the ones that identified this, including a really excellent scientist, uh, Dr. John Walsh, um, great guy. But anyway, I will have a separate video on the Arctic Dipole. So that's coming up. And so I, I will just briefly uh, mention here what this is. The Arctic Dipole Anomaly is a pressure pattern characterized by high pressure on the Arctic regions of North America, low pressure in those of Eurasia. This pattern sometimes replaces the Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation. It was observed for the first time in the, in the first decade of the 2000s and is perhaps linked linked to recent climate change. The Arctic Dipole lets more southern winds into the Arctic Ocean, resulting in more ice melting. The summer 2007 event played an important role in the record low sea ice extent, which was recorded in September. The Arctic Dipole has also been linked to changes in Arctic circulation pattern that caused drier winters in Northern Europe with much wetter winters in Southern Europe colder winters in East Asia, Europe, and eastern half of, the, of North America. Depending on what the Arctic Dipole is doing, sometimes it will, in certain uh, states, it will keep the ice really contained tightly within the Arctic Ocean Basin. Other times, it will increase the outflow of ice through the Fram Strait. That's it. I will be discussing that in, in a separate video uh, soon. In the northwestern part of the Atlantic, most of these winters were mild, especially 0910, which was the warmest recorded in Canada. The winter of 2010-2011 was particularly above normal in the northern Arctic regions of that country. The probability of cold winters with much snow in Central Europe rises when the Arctic is covered by less sea ice in summer because it can pull off more moisture from the water. Scientists of the research unit of Potsdam of the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research and the Helmholtz Association have decrypted a mechanism which a shrinking summertime sea ice cover changes the air pressure zones in the Arctic atmosphere and effects on European winter weather. Now, there will be climate deniers to say, see, this just shows it's all variations and there's no such thing as global warming. Shrinking summertime sea ice cover is due to global warming. <laughs> So what scientists do when they calculate the indices and look at this, they look at it, including the effects of global warming, and then they subtract out the effects of the global warming to calculate the indices to see what is happening. So they, they look at it with and without. It is accounted for. There's a particularly large-scale melt of Arctic sea ice in summer, as observed in recent years. Gee, I wonder why. Two important effects are intensified. Firstly, the retreat of the light ice surface reveals the darker ocean, causing it to warm up more in summer from solar radiation, the ice albedo feedback mechanism. In other words, if you have ice, the ice reflects the sun energy back into space. No ice, you have water, the water absorbs. Ice cover can no longer prevent the heat stored into the ocean being released into the atmosphere. It's called the lid effect. In other words, whatever heats in the water, if there's ice over it, the ice is a cap. It prevents that heat from being released into the atmosphere. No, no Arctic sea ice, nothing preventing that heat from going poof right into the atmosphere. And that's basically what's happening. As a result of the decreased sea ice cover, the air is warmed more greatly than it used to be, particularly in autumn and winter, because during this period, the ocean is warmer than the atmosphere. You know, the reason why Alaska has been having nice mild winters lately. The warming of the air near uh, to the ground leads to rising movements, right? We discussed that with low pressure system and the atmosphere becomes less stable. We discussed that with low pressure system. One of these patterns is the air pressure difference 
between the Arctic and mid latitudes. The Arctic Oscillation with the Azor highs and Iceland lows known from the weather reports. If this difference is high, pressure gradient, right? I discussed that in the rotating system video. If this difference is high, a strong westerly wind will result, which in winter carries warm, humid Atlantic air masses right down to Europe, usually during the positive phase. In the negative phase, when pressure differences are low, not as great, Cold Arctic air can then easily penetrate southward through Europe without being interrupted by the usual westerlies, as has been the case frequently over the last three winters. Model calculations show the air pressure difference with the decrease. Sea ice cover in the Arctic summer is weakened in the following winter, enabling Arctic cold to push down to mid-latitude. Oftentimes, this is accompanied by the jet stream dipping down, and we'll see that later on. When mild winter conditions in Greenland is present, this often coincides with severe winter conditions in Denmark and vice versa. This severe versus mild phenomenon is now recognized as an impact of the NAO. This prominent pattern of climate variability has a strong influence on weather over northeastern North America, Greenland, and Europe. Conditions associated with the two phases of this oscillation directly affect human demand for energy quality of crop yield, and the productivity of fisheries. And this is all being affected by global warming. Do not kid yourselves about that. It is happening. This is a changing. This global warming is changing how these systems, and so IPO, PDO, NAO, AO, AMO, whatever, all affecting how these systems are behaving. Air pressure over the two regions drives this oscillation. The high latitudes of the North Atlantic Ocean near Greenland and Iceland generally experience lower air pressure than surrounding region. This zone of low pressure is called the subpolar flow. I showed that to you in the, uh, the rotating uh, systems video. Farther to the south, air pressure over central North Atlantic Ocean is generally higher than surrounding regions. This atmospheric feature is called the subtropical high. Again, I showed that to you in the rotating systems video. Phases of the NAO are defined by higher than normal air pressure in one of these regions and lower than normal air pressure in the other. And they flip-flop back and forth. They oscillate, hence the NAO acronym. The anomalous patterns affect weather all around the Atlantic by influencing the intensity and location of the jet stream and the storm tracks that follow it. Excuse me. The NAO's positive phase. It's in a positive phase when both the subpolar low and the subtropical high are stronger than average. During positive NAO phases, the increased difference in pressure between the two regions results in a stronger Atlantic jet stream and a northward shift of the storm track. Consequently, northern Europe experiences increased storminess and precipitation and warmer than average temperatures that are associated with the air masses that arrive from lower latitudes. At the same time, Southern Europe experiences decreased storminess, below average precipitation. In Eastern North America, the positive phase, the NAO, generally brings higher air pressure, a condition associated with fewer cold air outbreaks and decreased storminess. Guess what happens during the negative phase? It's in a negative phase in both the subpolar low and the subtropical high are weaker than average. During negative NAO phases, the Atlantic jet stream and storm track have a more west to east orientation, and this brings decreased storminess below average precipitation, lower than average temperatures to northern Europe. Conversely, southern Europe experiences increased storminess above average precipitation, warmer than average temperatures. In eastern North America, the negative phase of NAO generally brings lower air pressure, a condition associated with stronger cold air outbreaks, increased storminess, including the famous nor'easters of New England. Now we get to some diagrams here. Okay, this is the North Atlantic Oscillation. This is a winter index, okay? And it's Lisbon to Reykjavik from December to March. And this is looking at years starting from like about uh, 1885 or so, and the data uh, has it collecting up through, oh, about 2000, uh, almost to the present time. 
it looks like about uh, yeah about the 2017 or so. So this is the winter index of the NAO based on the difference in normalized sea level pressure. Now that refers to atmosphere pressure at sea level, not sea level height. Between Lisbon, Portugal, and uh, the Stukas Sholmur, Reykjavik, Iceland. Since uh, 1864 with a LERS smoothing, that's this black line here, showing some sort of a oscillatory pattern. And if you look at the scale here, okay, the blue is the negative phase. And I guess call this brown. That's the uh, positive phase. So this is NaO positive. This is NaO negative. Okay. This is the difference of the normalized sea level pressure. What we just discussed in the previous two slides. The, the relative strengths of the sub, subpolar and subtropical highs. And this is uh, from uh, NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, the original paper was around 2003, but it keeps being updated regularly. So 2003 is here, and it just keeps being updated. So continued work. Okay, so this is the uh, NAO looking, narrowing down the range from 1900 to uh, basically it looks like about 2016 or so. So this is uh, the thick black line is the station-based NAO index, and then uh, red-blue shading is uh, this other group uh, doing that. But basically, again, you can see how it, uh, it flips back and forth is what this is showing. Okay. Um, so I'm really, uh, this is probably a very strong negative phase here. So it probably has some really <laughs> nasty conditions in the eastern U.S., eastern North America, and you know, likewise, some very strong positive NAOs there as well. Okay, I like this uh, diagram. So I, I like showing indices because they with indices you can see at a quick glance the oscillatory nature over time. This is showing what's going on here. So here's the Icelandic low, here's the Azores high. Right? More contour lines mean they are stronger. Okay. They're weaker here. So we have wet conditions and dry conditions. Wet conditions, dry conditions. You see how they flip flop from the positive phase to the negative phase. They flip flop. Okay. Now, this is what it does to the flow of the jet stream. Right? So on the left here is the positive phase. Okay. Cold air being here, you can see it is a it is constrained to a more northerly track. This is going to be wet and dry, right? Wet and dry, right? Showing that, and it's very very tight, no gesturing close to, uh, to polar regions. And in the negative phase, it meanders and dips down further south. So now we get cold conditions here. Wet conditions in southern Europe and the Mediterranean region, dry conditions over southern Scandinavia, and northern Europe. Right? It's wet over Scandinavia and northern Europe, dry over southern Europe and the Mediterranean. The cold is kind of like basically at the U.S. Canadian border here, but it drops down because the storm track brings it down into the Midwest. So positive, negative phase of the North Atlantic oscillation. And this is just, uh, we, I mentioned earlier the blocking. This is what's meant by the blocking, where you know it prevents the pressure systems from moving around. As you can see, it dips down low, bringing cold, snowy condition to southeastern North America, warm and less sea ice, cold and dry over uh, the Scandinavia, parts of northern Europe, warm and wet over southern Europe and the uh, Mediterranean. You got, the, you got the, a weak and high and a weak and low. And it, kind of, and it blocks so the jet stream moves up and over. That's in the negative mode. The positive mode, you see the jet stream is, is more direct, more zonal flow. And it's just kind of meridional, it's more meridional dipping down. And it's more, it's more of a westerly track, right? west to east. Now you have cold, more sea ice, it's warm. Warm and wet, cold and dry. Again, it flip flops. 
It literally does oscillate. Notice the, the pressure system strengthen. And this is just showing some really fun tracking stuff here. Um, you know, it gives you a little more detail. High pressure, say low pressure here. So um, here's the high off the Azores. This is the low off uh, the Icelandic low. And remember how I showed you in the rotating systems video that uh, the high pressure system and low pressure system often occur next to each other because of the remember the air pressure is moving in 3D. And so where you have a convergence in the low pressure system at the base and the divergence at the top, that leads to a convert uh, convergence at the high pressure at the top and the divergence at the bottom. You create those vertical convection cells. Right? Positive phase, the Azor high strengthens, as does the uh, Icelandic low, and you can see uh, what happens with the storm tracks. So you can you can look at this uh, a little closer detail. Pause the video, stare at it for a bit. But uh, these these series of, of videos kind of tell you the story of what's happening, and then this gets even uh, more fun, trying to show you how everything is just intertied together. So uh, the positive phase of the wintertime North Atlantic Oscillation. And a lot of attention is paid to the wintertime because of, of you know, the severity of, of the winter that people in various locations will experience. And so you have the strong low pressure here, strong uh, subtropical high pressure here. The jet stream brings it in. You get warm weather than usual in you know, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, drier and uh, than usual over Southern Europe and Mediterranean. And again, cold, more sea ice, stronger low, stronger high, warm and wet. It just brings the storm bang right over it. Right, brings it right over the top, cool and dry here. Whereas in the negative mode, the blocking prevents that storm track from slamming that, you know, slamming warm, wet weather over Northern Europe and Scandinavia. It dips down there, leaving them cold and dry. And then Southern Europe gets hit with the, with the wet stuff. And you can see what's happening here. The storm track goes further south. So as always, you can feel, you know, you're viewing these videos, you know, pause the video and examine these, uh, these slides here. It has a lot of information. SST, of course, is sea surface temperature. Um, not going to really uh, discuss that too much. He uh, said the NAO looks more at the air pressure. You know, of, of course, you know, depending on the storm track there, yeah, you got, it's going to affect the sea surface temperature somewhat. When the winter NAO index is well below zero, in other words, negative mode, that tan is warmer, the blue is colder. And precipitation uh, wetter and drier, right? And it's drier, it's wetter. It's kind of you know, that's the positive mode, negative mode, right? So wetter, drier. Cold and dry for the negative mode, and wet down there. So cold and dry, warm and wet. <laughs> Colder, dry. There we go. So this is showing the, the uh, well below zero, this is in the negative phase. Negative phase of the NAO, you get the wavier, the blocking high, you get the wavier jet stream. Versus the positive phase with fast zonal, right, following latitude in the lines. Just bang, right in there. Okay. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to show, you know, El Nino in the top here and La Nina down here. And what I wanted to do was show how it kind of ties in with what's going on with the NAO. So here's a El Nino. We have an El Nino say going from October to December, then January to March, April to June. So what's missing is July, August, September basically those three months. But what we see here is, okay, there's the low, there's the high, 
is you know cold dry right? so we know that's going to be uh that's that's what's happening in the el nino and la nina here is the positive track here right this is the winter months here this is the positive track this is the nao and the positive here cold air at the top here so the, the schematic showing the depiction of el nino la nina effects on climate in europe and the polar stratosphere for different uh seasons that's that's this here, polar stratosphere. Note that for the pressure center as well as for the position of the storm track and strength of the polar vortex, absolute values are shown. Relative deviations can be judged from the size and style of the font and the arrows. Okay. Precipitation and temperature refers to relative values. Okay. What the previous slide indicates is that when there is an El Nino event, the NAO typically will be in the negative phase, bringing cold, dry conditions to northern Europe and Scandinavia during the winter. Okay, that's El Nino up here. Right? And we bring cold, dry conditions to northern Europe. Right? Cold, dry. Winter, cold, dry. Obviously, April to June is coming out of winter. So El Nino, so this top row here, we're basically having a positive phase of the NAO. When there's a La Nina event, the NAO, excuse me, this is going to be in the negative phase. When there's a La Nina event, the NAO will be in the positive phase, bringing warm, wet conditions to Northern Europe and Scandinavia during the winter. Okay? And we can see that here, right? Warm and wet, right here. Warm and wet. So La Nina, right, the direct storm track. So the NAO is in the positive phase here. Here, the NAO is in the negative phase here, and we have cold, dry conditions. But don't forget, El Nino moves eastward, the Lowe's does, and with the teleconnection between the atmosphere and the oceans, I remember I discussed that towards the end of the uh, ENSO video, yeah, it makes sense that there will be some connections as to what El ENSO does something, NAO will respond, and, and so forth. And so Enso could be driving NAO, and NAO could be driving Enso. So this is just showing that uh, El Nino can be associated typically with uh, the negative phase uh, and La Nina with the positive phase. Okay, so I'll, I'll end this video here, as you just saw a sneak preview. Uh, I'm going to next do a video discussing the Arctic Constellation. So, basically, this is what we're seeing. Okay. This shows the relative strength of the pressure system and what's happening. This is the negative mode, that's the positive mode. And, uh, yeah. and then at the end, I showed you how it tied in to ENSO. There's a La Nina event, it's typically associated with the positive phase. The El Nino event, typically associated with the negative phase. So, this is La Nina, that's El Nino. Well, thank you for your time. I hope you found this informative and uh, stay tuned as we continue. Uh, or a little tour of our oscill oscillation systems. And by the way, um, starting with the, uh, the rotating system the, uh, video, this is now on my fixed up computer. Um, so it's good to be, <laughs> it's good to be back operational. I thank you for your patience during my downtime. Hey folks, this is Jim here reminding you to please subscribe to my channel and please share my videos with others. Also remember to click the bell so that you know when I drop in a new video. I also ask that you please consider becoming a patron of my channel and support the work that I do by going to patreon.com forward slash science talk with Jim Massa, each word separated by an underscore. And becoming a patron. It's asking for as little as three dollars a month, cost of a cup of coffee, to support the work I do and keep my 
informative videos coming your way. Thank you. Thank you for your support.